I should say I'm very pleased and honored to be here. And we should all be grateful to the organizers for setting up such a remarkably interesting conference, uh, both, of course, for its scientific contents and for its surroundings and uh, the conditions in which we're living together for a few days. This being my first time in India, I appreciate this very much. So I'm going to speak about uh, the rheology of uh, cohesive granular, uh, sorry, wet granular materials, which are a specific instance of cohesive granular materials. And I changed the title a little bit. Instead of focusing only on DEM, I'll also compare to experimental results. So these results were obtained uh, in collaboration with several PhD students in our lab, Laboratoire Navier, and uh, also with the contribution of two experimentalist colleagues, Abdullah Ifal and Admin Tong, and the students being Michel Badetti, Vin Dutan, and Said Ramsey, former PhD students. So uh, we're considering uh, for the numerical studies a very simple model, and we're, we mimic this uh, uh, simple uh, model system in the lab. Uh, our material it's made uh, it's simply made of wet spheres with uh, small liquid bridges joining neighboring grains. So uh, why study such systems? There are of course direct applications to industrial processes such as mixing and granulation. And as already said, it's also a particular instance of a model cohesive system for which quantitative comparisons are possible between experiments and simulations. And beyond this cohesive aspect, or aside from those cohesive aspects, it, uh, we also have to worry about this uh, system as a case of mixture of grains and fluids, so two phases, and we have to investigate the influence of the liquid quantity and the distribution of the liquid in the material. As I said, we uh, confine our numerical studies to this simple case, which, is very, which lends itself very easily to DEM studies. And it's also the case when the cohesion effects are the strongest, so that's, uh, that's good. Uh, of course, we, we all know uh, about the effect of cohesions, uh, the ability of sandcastles to stand, for instance. This is a direct uh, consequence of cohesive forces, that, uh, such that grains stick to their neighbors. And uh, cohesion, if we look, the, these are old results on 2D systems. Uh, I'm sorry for the display, it's not, well, it's not optimal. This is the familiar force chain picture in a co cohesion-less granular pack in 2D. I'm using 2D images here to visualize things easily. And in the presence of cohesion, one may stabilize extremely loose structures, so that, that's interesting to explore uh, the mechanical consequences of such microstructures. Now back to 3D and uh, wet uh, spheres. The model to do simulations is quite simple. We have uh, elasticity and intergranular friction. We, ha we have several thousands of spherical grains of diameter A. Capillary forces act through liquid bridges joining pairs of neighbors and we use this simplified form of the capillary force. It's not the most accurate one, but it's quite convenient. And uh, when we checked if the, uh, using a more accurate formula changed anything, we found out it was not sensitive to the shape of that, of that form. So it, it, we have F0 minus F0, minus means attractive, at contact. So H is the distance, so H negative means contact deflection, contacting grains. And we have a decay of uh, the intensity of the force with the growing interparticle distance that can be modeled by this function here, V be being the uh, volume of the meniscus, H the distance here. So it has this aspect. Oh, it's ugly, I'm afraid. Wait. Sorry. And uh, okay, different formula uh, give you slightly different results, but this has little, uh, few consequences on the macroscopic behavior. Uh, one interesting uh, consequence of uh, uh, cohesive forces in the contacts by which it affects the microstructure uh, very much is the enhancement of frictional effects because the uh, Coulomb inequality, 
does not apply to the total normal force, it only applies to the repulsive part of the normal force. So in a pair, uh, in a contacting pair where the total normal force is zero, uh, the contact is still able to transmit a tra tangential force mu f zero, mu being the coefficient of friction, the intergranular coefficient of friction. Um, so, like this. Uh, the uh, model material, the tests and the control parameters are as follows. Uh, we have to introduce a liquid content. In, in the experiments, it should not be too small because many sky or liquid bridges have to exist. It shouldn't be too large to stay within the so-called pendular regime of isolated bridges. Uh, we have capillary hysteresis. That is to say, uh, the bridge forms as soon as the grains contact one another, but not before. They have to touch for the bridge to appear. But they, it stays uh, until a rupture distance, uh, if the grains are separated, it, it exists until a rupture distance D0 is reached. D0 is equal to the meniscus volume to the power one third. Saturation is in that range. Or we, prefer, we often prefer to use the liquid content uh, which, is, which we define as the ratio of the liquid volume fraction to the solid volume fraction, and we sometimes denote it as epsilon, uh, reaching about 8%. Now, uh, given the macro-mechanical parameters, one important dimensionless uh, control parameter is this reduced pressure or, or reduced stress. We, we, t we take P, the pressure, or the the control stress, and we divide it by the uh, tensile strength of the contact, the maximum attractive force, multiply it by diameter squared, so this is dimensionless. This gives us, given the formula we use, this gives us this ratio involving the, the interfacial uh, tension gamma. And, uh, of course, the meaning of P star is that when it's very small, cohesion dominates, and it may stabilize very open loose structures, and when it's very large, cohesion gradually becomes, uh, has become negligible and the confining stress dominates. It's, uh, and the, the material behaves like a dry material. So these are orders of magnitude showing that capillary co cohesion is not very, is not very strong, but we, we have to work under low stresses. Actually, the experiments I'm about to describe in a short while, or to evoke in a short while, gives us P star equal to one at this low uh, to 260 Pascal, as this low value of the applied stress. Now, let's consider the test uh, we are deal dealing with, mainly. Uh, a shear flow with control normal stress, li like we want to generalize the uh, results about dry granular flow, dense granular flow uh, to uh, cohesive systems, to wet gra grains. So we control sigma 2, 2. Actually, P is equal, uh, the control stress is sigma 2, 2. So here we, we define P star with sigma 2, 2, for instance. So it's a quiet, uh, quiet flow. But, uh, in the, in the lab, it's between rough uh, walls, and in, in, the, in the computer, it's with periodic boundary conditions. And we have this inertial, inertial number, or inertia number, already used by different speakers in this conference, uh, characterizing the distance to, quasi, to the quasi-static limit, uh, okay, which is the so-called critical state of uh, geomechanics. Um, so, uh, this is how, uh, well, some things do not appear very well, but this is how we control shear flow with Lee's Edwards boundary conditions in simulations. So, everything is periodic. We avoid edge effects totally by just avoiding edges. There is, there is no wall effects because there are, uh, we have no walls at all. This is the aspect of one sample uh, in its periodic cell. And experimentally, uh, my colleague Abdoulaye Fall was among those who pioneered the use of rotational rheometers to measure the rheology of granular materials. So this is a sketch of the rheometer. The gray part is fixed. The light blue part is rotating about this uh, yellow axis. And some, some walls are, have very low friction deliberately to ensure something looking like uh, quite flow. 
between bottom and top. And average shear stress uh, is deduced from, from the torque, solid fraction from the volume of this box because this is free to dilate in the vertical direction. And uh, yes, and we control the force uh, here, normal force on, on, the, on the upper lid. Uh, one, this is a little digression. This is just a reminder of how advantageous it, it is to deal with normal stress control flows uh, with respect uh, compared to uh, fixed density flows. These are all results uh, obtained on frictionless hard spheres uh, with a very low inertial, inertial number close to the quasi-static limit obtained with a former PhD of mine, uh, Pierre-Emmanuel Penault. And what, what we did here, so we, we, investi we investigated the internal friction of frictionless beads. And uh, what we did here is, in the first stage, up to gamma uh, uh, shear strain equal to one, we controlled sigma 2, 2 equal to one in our, in our units. Uh, while uh, phi, the solid fraction, was fluctuating. The fluctuations are to be read on this axis here, so fluctuations are small. But now, if we change the boundary control and set uh, phi to fix phi to its average value in the past, as shown here, uh, we see that sigma 2, 2 is going to fluctuate, but is going to fluctuate wildly from zero to four, and its average should be one, you know, because it's the same material state, but it's, you see how difficult it is to extract an average in such a situation. So first message is that it's, so, it's very much more, it's much more convenient to use this control rather than that one. Second message here is that the uh, behavior of the material is very nicely expressed by this, what we define as the uh, macroscopic friction coefficient, that is to say sigma 1, 2 divided by sigma 2, 2, because this quantity just does not feel the change of control here. So it, it's really what expresses best the behavior of the material, we believe. Okay, end of digression, back to wet grains. Here are our, now our numerical results. Uh, with this value of the friction coefficient obtained uh, within that thesis and uh, as presented in this publication here, uh, we see that there is an important effect of uh, co um, capillary forces on internal friction coefficient. These are the results here versus inertial number of mu star for different values of p star. So p star inf infinite is just dry grains. And the, 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 the lower p star, uh, the more relatively important the capillary forces are relative to the confining forces. So we see that the internal friction coefficient increases almost by a factor of three in that range of p star here, down to 0.444. Uh, on the other hand, phi, the solid fraction, decreases, decreases, but by a relatively modest uh, proportion here, as you see, uh, from z nearly near 0 0.6 to somewhat above 0 0.5 here. Doesn't become very loose in that range of parameters. Um, we, well, the shape of the curve is relatively the same with perhaps a larger interval of values uh, close to the quasi-static limit. Now, uh, it would be very interesting to go to low, lower P star values, no, more important uh, cohesion yet, but, but we have this trouble that what we observe then is, oh, no, I should, I should not turn the page like that, like this. Uh, that we have systematic uh, shear band formation for small p star. This is how we monitor it, defining this parameter, which basically uh, quantifies the departure from the quet linear velocity profile. In, uh, so this is bottom, top, 
this is the coordinate that varies along the velocity gradient. Gamma dot x2 is, is a quite profile, so we square it and we integrate it, we average it. And this coefficient here is such that delta would be equal to 1 in the case of total localization, one solid block sliding uh, onto against one an, another solid block. So here is the are the profile of solid fraction uh, with values uh, written on the upper axis here he, um, and velocity uh, values to be read there velocity profile so this is a non -local localized case this is an instantaneous velocity profile so it fluctuates about the quet profile and this is what we see in in, uh, in the case of localization, so we have very much like a solid block sliding against another solid block. And within that shear band, we see that the density decreases significantly. So uh, the, these two states correspond to the beginning, 20 here, and the end of that curve there. Uh, in that range, and this is how delta evolves with this sudden jump from non-localized, a little bit fluctuating, and strongly localized situations. So, well, this is just an example, and we, in the rest of our study, we just avoided such situations, and that's why we could not go to very small p star. Well, we can measure quite a few other different quantities uh, pertaining to the rheology, like normal stress difference, shown here, we see that well, they change significantly due to the after we introduce uh, cohesion uh, and, and, and as cohesion gets stronger, uh, expressed by decreasing P star. So this is N1, N2, which takes non-negligible values here uh, compared to the dry case, which is the black curve at the bottom. Uh, beware of the signs. We, we use opposite signs compared to fluid mechanics conventions. We, we have sigma 2, 2 equal to 1. Okay, uh, the, liquid, the influence of liquid content on this rheology is by no means negligible. This is shown here in, those, uh, in this set of results, uh, for which they, uh, menis uh, the meniscus volume changes from 10 to minus 3, which is about this value of liquid content expressed by this ratio, down to a very small value, uh, very the limit of extremely small menisci ne very nearly. So this, this is the, the, how it changes for this value of P star if we reduce the size of the meniscus to almost nothing. And same effect at P star equal to 1. Uh, meanwhile, we only see a slight decrease of solid fraction if we, incre sorry, if we increase the, the uh, liquid content. So here, with significant increase of mu star, if we increase the liquid contents and slight decrease of solid fraction. Okay. Now we can investigate the microstructure uh, coordination numbers, but we have to distinguish between contact coordination number, ZC, and uh, distant interaction coordination number, corresponding to pairs interacting by a bridge without contact. And this is how these quantities vary with I for different P star, as in the previous uh, uh, graphs. Uh, infinity down to one uh, fraction. And so we see that the contact coordination number decreases as a function of I, the, the, as, as, it does in, uh, as it does in dry granular flow. The, 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 uh, away from the quasi-static limit, uh, inertial effects agitate the system and it, it's also dilated. So, uh, on the other hand, the distant coordination number increases. So that, in fact, the sum of the two is constant. Ah, uh, oh, that, it, it works this time. But, uh, uh, so that the sum of the two, the total coordination number, remains constant or nearly constant over quite a large interval of inertial numbers. So uh, equal to its quasi-static limit, in fact. There's a near, near compensation of both effects. And this uh, correlates with the data we have on the 
age or the lifetime of uh, contacts or of uh, interactions. Uh, the, uh, well, it decreases like this. It's expressed here not versus time, but versus uh, shear strain. So we, we multiply time by gamma dot, and this is the distribution of contact ages. Uh, sorry, I'm disappointed. It's, it's so nice on my screen and so ugly here. Uh, <laughs> I should have tried, uh, ma made a test. Uh, <clears throat> so it decreases uh, nearly exponentially uh, about one, and the, 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 this corresponds to contacts opening as uh, pairs uh, tumble in the, the average shear flow. They are immersed in this average flow, so they undergo this motion. The approach tend to, pairs tend to approach here, so we see m many more contacts. And receding, in receding pairs, contacts ten, tend to open. So this is of order one, even though as we increase cohesion, the decreasing time, uh, the uh, contacts uh, tend to live longer. But more interesting is the distribution of liquid bridges, because when the contact opens, the liquid bridge can survive. And this is what's already hinted by this uh, coordination number. When, when we, the, the, the flow is faster, coordination number decreases, but uh, con the contact coordination number decreases, but the uh, liquid bridge coordination number increases. So it means that contacts become liquid bridges. And we see here that the lifetime of liquid bridges is significant, significantly longer. A sig uh, a non-negligible or a, a not so small proportion uh, of uh, contacts, of uh, sorry, of liquid bridges survive several times gamma, so they might tumble and completely rotate in the average flow. And this feature is also independent of I, which agrees, which uh, is in agreement with the observation about coordination numbers. Now, uh, of course, we we have to worry about the orientation of contacts expressed by the, this fabric parameter. For contacts, given the, the, the shape of the flow and the orientation of axis, F12 is negative. Liquid, liquid bridges, the total population of liquid bridges between contacting grains and between non-contacting grains have uh, also a negative F12. Uh, with a smaller magnitude, so the anisotropy is smaller. Distant interactions have the opposite uh, anisotropy uh, because they are more represented between those, these kind of pairs in the receding quadrants. Uh, now let's compare these two experiments. Uh, so first, we have to input the correct parameters in the simulation, and the one we're missing is the intergranular friction coefficient. So to find it, we represent the global, the macroscopic friction coefficient and the macroscopic density in the quasi-static limit of a shear flow of dry grains. And we find that this value, 0 0.09, of the intergranular friction coefficient uh, is the correct one uh, to, to obtain the experimentally measured friction coefficient, about 0 0.25, and the experimentally measured density, uh, solid fraction, about 0 0.615 uh, here. So we adopt this value, and this is all the fitting. Uh, there is no more, uh, no more fitting to be done, and then we can compare versus inertial number, the in, uh, macroscopic friction coefficient and the solid fraction in those uh, shear flows of wet granular materials versus I for different values of P star ranging from 2 to 9 to infinity for the dry case at the bottom. So this uh, agreement is quite good uh, for all the, those values of P star as we see here, not exact, but uh, so the experiments are those big dots and the uh, simulation results are those data points you hardly see, but they are connected by solid lines. So solid line is not far from the big dots. So encouraging, and in particular, we made 
uh, rather in control the approximations in our numerical model about the presence of the liquid with this uh, liquid bridge appearing magically as soon as the grain starts, and we, we don't care about conservation of the liquid volume. But the, the, the rheology is there, and it's very close to the experimental rheology. Moreover, experimentally, we can access the microstructure through X-ray microtomography, and these are cuts through the samples. So we see first that there is no large-scale heterogeneity, and uh, furthermore, we can see the conformation, the local conformation of the liquid. So this is one liquid bridge here. This, these are three liquid bridges, one, two, three, uh, that, that, that start to merge. So we, we are a little bit, we are going a little bit out of the pendular regime here. And uh, my colleagues even uh, did the statistics uh, about the frequency of isolated bridges, dimers, trimers, or larger clusters. So here, with this value of the solid content, we are very much within the pendular regime. Then we're there for this larger liquid content, we're exiting the pendular regime, but uh, not that much. And the interesting aspect here, and the good news, is that the larger gamma, the, the larger the strain, the, the less frequent the, the the merge, uh, the merge liquid bridge clusters are, so less trimers if you go to a larger gamma here, less, less larger clusters. This is a classification of those patterns we see here. So results published in this paper. So this is rather good news. Now, uh, how much time do we have? Okay, I uh, would like to explain the uh, hmm? 12 minutes, okay. I, I'd like to, to explain the increase of shear resistance uh, brought about by the uh, cohesive capillary forces. First, let's, let's see whether we can describe cohesive effects by this classical more Coulomb yield criterion. I'm focusing now on the quasi-static limit. I'm trying just, well, to explain that the curve moves up. Let's try to explain how, why the first point move, moves up. So, the static limit. Uh, this, this is the more Coulomb relation, so this is the macroscopic friction coefficient, a macroscopic friction coefficient, and this is the Coulomb cohesion, the cohesion of a material is this parameter here. But, of course, this relation has to explain has, has to be, uh, has to be uh, valid for a, a cohesion to be identified. So equivalently, we might divide this by sigma 2,2, 2, and so uh, friction coefficient will appear here, and this will appear there, because sigma 2,2 2 up to some const constant uh, coefficient is P star, and we define a reduced cohesion P, uh, C star like that similar, uh, C star is to C, what P star is to sigma 2, 2. Now, I directly here wrote mu star zero infinity, sorry for that notation, but zero means I equal to zero, quasi-static limit. Infinity means P star infinite, so a uh, dry material. So I if I write this with mu star one, I immediately realize that this should be this uh, dry quasi-static uh, macroscopic friction coefficient just by considering large P star cases in which the cohesion disappears. So we, we should recover the behavior of the dry material. So we have this. Now we have to check whether this works. So the slope, we, we just plot this sigma 1, 2 divided by sigma 2, 2 in the quasi-static limit, defined as mu zero star, mu star, with a zero for quasi-static, i tending to zero, versus one over p star. And does, does that work? Well, not so, yes, that works, at least for p star larger than two. This is the, uh, this plot for, both for experiments with some symbols and simulations with the triangles. So the intercept here should be friction coefficient, which is about the same, dry friction coefficient, the macroscopic one in the quasi-static limit, and the slope, which is the same on, two, on the, those two fits, two linear fits, is the uh, Coulomb cohesion, 
the C star, the reduced Coulomb cohesion. Now, now the, how, this is how it varies with liquid content. It increases. Numerical results are red dots. Uh, uh, experimental ones are these plus signs here. Well, this nicely agrees. And other symbols refer to theoretical predictions. I would like to present very briefly. And how can we predict that? Well, one simple idea in the geomechanics literature is the idea of effective stresses. So the idea is that stress, uh, stresses are the sum of contact stresses due to the contact force forces and capillary stresses due to capillary forces. And if we plot this ratio, sigma 1, 2 contact contribution divided by contact contribution to sigma 2, 2, for a large set of data with different friction coefficients, different liquid contents, we see those horizontal lines with values associated with the dry friction coefficient, which depends on mu, so the d different values of intergranular friction coefficient here. So what we see is that the, the uh, effective stress idea works surprisingly well. Uh, the departure, the relative error here is a few percent, in fact, if you look at the axis. Um, uh, so this gives us uh, if we assume th this applies and replace this by uh, its values in the more Coulomb uh, relation, or no, uh, no, if we just use this and uh, express the stress ratio uh, with this, this, these different components, we end up with that. So, in fact, this is uh, more Coulomb. Uh, with 1 over p star, or 1 over sigma 2, 2, and this gives us the, uh, uh, the cohesion, and this predicts sigma 1, 2, the resistance to shear. We have to pay attention to the signs here, assuming sigma 1, 2 is positive. Uh, then both con capillary contributions to stresses are negative, which means this one uh, increases, enhances the resistance to shear as, as if uh, capillary forces were pressing grains uh, onto one another, uh, similarly to uh, an additional pressure, so this effective pressure, whereas that one, because of its sign, uh, tends to, because it's negative, tends to reduce the resistance to shear. Now, uh, if we use these relations, uh, it's repeated here, actually, we, we might also remember then uh, uh, the, uh, that the uh, sigma 2, 2 capillary can be easily predicted like that. This is a very familiar formula in granular mechanics. And uh, while well, counting F0 uh, for each capillary interaction, we have to average the coordination number because it drops down a little bit for distant interactions. Anyway, this, uh, this, if we only keep that, keep the sigma 2, 2 here and neglect that. This is what is referred to in the literature as the Rumpf formula. And this predicts the value of the uh, uh, capillary cohesion in, in reduced form like this. Now, if we use this also to predict mu star, this is predicted versus measured using the complete formula. So nearly the first diagonal. And this is the predicted versus measured using the simplified approach with the room formula. And uh, it's not so bad either. So we can predict, actually, the uh, cohesion uh, using, uh, using uh, data like coordination numbers and fabric parameters. You know, this one, this one tends to decrease the shear resistance. And in fact, uh, it decreases as capillary fabric decreases in absolute value uh, when we have more distant interactions, that is to say when we have more fluid. So we, we, when we have more fluid, more liquid, we increase the cohesion because the decreasing, the decreasing term due to the, uh, this uh, contribution of capillary forces to the uh, shear stress, the decreasing term decreases, hence the sum increases. So that's, uh, that's how we obtain this better prediction here, uh, which captures this decreasing trend of the capillary cohesion. So that uh, ends up my 
a study of shear flow. So we, we saw that it enhances a lot the apparent friction, sigma 1, 2 divided by sigma 2, 2. It decreases a little the density compared to the dry case. We, we obtained this good agreement between experiments and simulations once the intergranular friction coefficient is identified. We see that aggregates uh, of grays joined by liquid bridges survive shear, uh, hence a lesser I dependence as uh, P star decreases. Shear localization for small P star and this simple traditional effective pressure approach possible for not too small P star and uh, allows us to understand uh, the, this friction, internal friction enhancement. More Coulomb uh, condition, uh, uh, yield criterion applicable for not too small P star too. And uh, that, that's, th these are all my conclusions. I had a second part, I have no time. So please ask me questions about the second part. That was uh, the compression of loose states. <laughs> uh, okay. I can show you the compression, the conclusions of my second part. I'm, uh, I lance. Oh, you're, you're being very nice. <laughs> uh, so we, we, the idea is if we can assemble loose states and see how it uh, behaves, how the system behaves under increasing pressure. So this is the recipe, I will not comment it, to assemble loose states that are stable, that are equilibrated, solid, in, in some range of uh, stresses. First, you have the, 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 the message is first you have to aggregate the grains before applying the pressure, and then you can stabilize a loose, a loose system, and its characteristics are somewhat dependent on the process. And experimentally, th this was done uh, by mixing glass beads with water, and then through pluviation, uh, through a sieve that separates cl clusters of more than two beads. So pluviation, uh, grains, rain, uh, rain deposition of the grains. Um, and uh, well, we see this behavior. This is actually because of my soil mechanics, mechanics colleagues. This is the void ratio. Void ratio is one over phi minus one. So it decreases, means the, the system gets irregularly compressed. And if you decrease the pressure, this is P star, if you decrease the pressure, it will uh, stay in, in a dense state, of course. So you have different curves, different, corresponding to different initial states. So uh, evolution of coordination numbers. One comparison to experimental result here with the red and yellow curves being experimental compression curves that you know, fall in the same range as uh, uh, numerical ones. Everything takes place between P star equal to 10 to minus 1, 10 to minus 2, and P star equal to a few units. So uh, P star equal to 1 is when uh, in the range where things happen, where uh, w as soon as the system is dominated by the confinement, it has collapsed. Okay, and these are different initial structures. Uh, just the message here is that density is not everything depending on how you assemble the system, they all have the same density. The coordination number increases from here to there, and the distribution of void sizes too. So we have to classify initial states and their influence on the compression curve. These are conclusions, and these are global perspectives. Thank you for your attention. I welcome your questions. We have five minutes for questions, please. Uh, that one adjustable parameter you mentioned at the beginning, mu equals 0 0.09. Yes. Is, was, is that the dry, uh, the assumed co Coulomb coefficient? For the no, polystyrene? this is the intergranular friction coefficient sure. for, for those polystyrene beads. Okay. Used it it in seems the very low compared to what people normally put in. Numerical simulations, I don't know about polystyrene beads. Does it have anything to do with sliding friction? And, uh, uh, well, the trouble is that everybody likes uh, glass beads. 
which is a horrible system. Uh, and uh, in fact, quite, uh, there are many, many, many systems in which uh, the comparison is easier than with glass beads uh, between uh, simulation and experiments. And usually, those are systems in which the friction coefficient is lower than what we like to use. I, I think it's, it, might, it might be in the, the other way. We, we're just all used to setting friction coefficients to values that are a little high <laughs> compared to really good model systems. Uh, do, you, do you allow, here, do you allow the cohesion to degrade uh, with distance between your particles? Excuse me? Do you allow the cohesion, the cohesive bridges to degrade with distance between your particles? Because at some point they are going to go far apart that there is no more liquid bridge connecting them, right? Uh, yes, there, there is the rupture distance equal to the volume of the meniscus to the power one third in good approximation. So, so the, the, the cohesive force, the attractive force decreases uh, for, as the distance increases. Uh, uh, this was shown at the beginning. Uh, you have one more question, go ahead. Yeah, this curve. And I had one more clarification. So essentially what you're doing is uh, that, that cohesion you're adding as an extra to the P prime, right? So you're adding that as a pressure. Is that, is that what you're doing? I, I uh, uh, at the end, yes, yeah. this. Uh, yeah, in the end, yeah. No, nope. Effective stress. Right. Yes, so yes, you can, you can do that. It works, uh, and it works rather well. Uh, this is, you can criticize this, uh, uh, of course. It, it, it's, there's no reason, there's no deep reason why it works so well, uh, except maybe the fact that, the, the problem is that this, uh, this stress component, uh, they, they do not, no, this, this does not equally break the grains. Uh, but maybe the grains are not so sensitive to a stress field that does not equilibrate each of them in, that, in this case. So uh, you had showed plots of the first and second normal stress difference. And if I account for what you said about the convention being opposite, N1 seemed negative. Uh, uh, where was it? <coughs> yeah, here. So the, in the N1 cohesive, here is negative. cohesive regime, N1 is, so one is the flow direction? Uh, uh, one here, uh, no, it's the, uh, is the control stress in the gradient direction. Oh, 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 okay. The value one is the value of sigma 2, 2, and I index one is the, uh, the coordinate index in the flow direction, yes. Yes, sorry. So do you have an argument for the N1 changing sign as you decrease P star? Um, not really. Uh, I, we, we should, I, 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 I can't explain that to you right now, but should I do it, I would go to the fabric terms and uh, it's possible that we could, involve, could invoke the uh, persistence of liquid bridges in the extension quadrant to, 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 to explain that. Yeah, uh, in your shear band formation, you mentioned that uh, density increases during shear band formation. So density increases? Density during increases during the shear band formation. Uh, no, no, it decreases. It decreases. Uh, That's what uh, uh, you well, mentioned. It density increases. Wait, wait, wait. It, uh, the, the, the density within the shear band uh, yeah. decreases, but it's possible that the average density increases because you have two solid blocks and a shear band, and the solid blocks might, might be quite dense. Might, might be denser than before. Uh, before shear banding, that, that, uh, it I, should I, dilate, right? I mean, within I, the shear band. I guess band. This, this this could happen. Uh, yeah, if we, you, you're absolutely right. Here, it's the same system, uh, two different uh, situations, before and after the onset of shear banding. So uh, the, the average here is above the average there. You're absolutely right, yes. Oh, thank you. So, can I, uh, 
So in even in dry granular flows, it is well known that you have here. Yeah. So the intergranular friction coefficient becomes is important when you have low values of friction coefficient, even in dry grains. So for example, if I do the experiment with mu point one versus mu point five. I see a huge change, but then if you go beyond, let's say, mu 0.5, you don't see any change even in the dry regime. That's, that's true, so, yes. So would your results be applicable because you have used a very low value of mu? Let's say your interparticle granular friction is very high, following on Joe's question. Would you still expect the same sort of thing to hold? Well, uh, actually, we, uh, there, there are uh, the, the 0.09 is the value of mu that corresponds to the experiments, but numerically, we, we did all uh, uh, a large set of values between 0 0.05 and 0 0.3. So, so uh, we, yeah, we saw the same behavior. Okay, quick question, I think, last one. Following on uh, Joe's question and Anurag's question, uh, you said regarding the mu equal to 0 0.09, that is for polystyrene grains, but to my knowledge in DM, we restrained the overlap uh, delta. I, I think we have used Hertz and contact model, but when you were using polystyrene beads in experiments, I think the overlap will be perhaps greater than what you are seeing in simulations. Uh, the, your question is about uh, elastic deflection of contact. contact. Well, it's uh, quite small in experiments, and it is quite small in the simulation. We, we, don't, have, we don't have a problem with it. Uh, we, we, can, we can even use the, the real value of, real values of uh, grain elasticity. It's, uh, and it, it's, well, it's essentially irrelevant for those uh, behaviors we've been investigating. It, it would matter for some quasi-static tests uh, under high pressure, or uh, of course it would be relevant for macroscopic elasticity, but uh, we, it's not relevant, and anyway, we, we, we can use the real value <laughs> in that case. It's, it's not... Uh, not a problem. Okay. So thank you very much. And uh, thank you. Thank you.